Hello again and welcome back to another Sunday service with the Baja Crew. We're going to open again with our prayer. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed would be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts and trespasses, as we also forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. If you have any prayer requests, please put them in the comments and we will get to them at the end of the service. So don't feel free to leave whatever kind of prayer requests you would like, if it's for family or friends or your country, uh, anything you would like us to pray over, please put it in the comments now. Our Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of the heavens and the earth. I believe in Yeshua, the Christ, his transcendent Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born to mankind. He was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead, and on the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and was seated at the right hand of the Father. He has come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the word of God, the returned son, Lord Rael in his great commandment to love God and love each other. In the holy ecumenical order of Christ, the forgiveness of sins and the resurrection of the body and life everlasting. Amen. Today's speaker will be Cardinal Joseph Monti, who's going to give you a fantastic sermon. Cardinal? Thank you, brother. Let us pray. Almighty Father, we come before you today humbled and ready to serve you. Father, please guide us as we continue to grow in your ways and will. Please allow for this message to open the minds and pierce the hearts of those who need it most. And please allow us to all grow in your ways and your wisdom as we continue to fulfill your actions towards building a kingdom here on earth. In the name of Lord Rael, we pray. Amen. The word of the Lord according to Genesis, chapter 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. This fundamental verse constructs the foundation of one of the most important, yet arguably one of the most overlooked aspects of all of Scripture. Today's topic will focus on psychology. Now, when you think of the word psychology, uh, Perhaps what comes to mind is uh, a man looking old and frail, you know, long white beard, glasses resting ever so gently on the tip of his nose, explaining in whimsical constructs the nature of our dreams, our urges, our desires, and our lusts, as he sits in an old leather chair wearing a drab suit, puffing away at his pipe. Or perhaps we think of psychology today as a science too vast for the average person to truly understand its mechanisms, particularly on an institutional level. Certainly modern science, as in most cases, has offered to protect people from the burden of knowledge, simply by explaining things in a reductionist, materialist view, one can find comfort in being told that they are nothing but a collection of atoms, randomly floating in space, where consciousness is a problem that has yet to be explained. But don't worry, to alleviate this problem, we will simply place in hierarchical subservience to the uncontrollable primal instincts of our nature, 
stemming from an earlier phase of our Darwin evolution, we allow for ourselves to become deluded. Therefore, it is these human urges which are to be lifted up and worshipped above all else, no matter how heinous, immoral, or at the very least insipid they may be. Is it any wonder why many people say that science and the Bible consistently contradict each other? Modern studies of psychology, not unsimilar to the various branches of other physical science, remain in a schism with religious studies, which makes this topic especially difficult to address because of all the confusion around it. But if we want to continue allowing these misconceptions to breed, we as the faithful may as well serve the egos of every atheist healthy portions of prime rib with glasses of fine cabernet until they are so full they can't even walk away from the table. That is what we do when we ignore fundamental truths universal to all life, no matter what you believe. Generally speaking, psychology offers a glimpse into how man works and what makes his gears turn. Seems like an incredibly important discipline. So why doesn't the Bible focus on psychology? Actually, come to find out, the Bible not only focuses on psychology, it places a high premium on the subject. So high, in fact, that it will surprise you just how important it is. Let's start by looking at the actual definition of psychology. The term psychology derives from the Greek word psyche. The word psyche literally means soul. Hmm. Psychology pertains, therefore, to a study of the soul or spirit of mankind. The etymology of the word psyche stems from the Greek word psuka, which means breath of life. Interesting. Now keep that in mind as we revisit Genesis 2-7, where it says, And the Lord God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Fascinating. Right there, we see clear evidence that at its core essence, psychology is the study of the breath of life that God gave you, the living soul that animates you. According to Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, we are made in the image of God, and we have been given dominion over his creation. What is it that separates us from the beasts of the wild? It is our heightened state of consciousness, or more specifically, our sentience, the breath of life that we hold, that stands out from the rest of living beings and makes us as we are in the likeness of God. Humans are, of course, very complex creatures. That's certainly an obvious fact. It is easily understood that we are very, very different from the rest of the animal kingdom. We stand out as pack leaders in any situation, but not because we can run faster or shoot poison. No, we are not the biggest, strongest, most muscular beasts on the earth. Instead, we have been given an intellectual muscle that gives us reign over our environment, both in a predatory and protectionist sense. It's our intellect which makes us stronger and far superior in most every situation that calls for our survival in nature. This is a gift from God, and only those who use their creative intellect to its maximum potential are afforded the best lives within humanity. The psyche is our strongest muscle. It is the brawn that makes us a force to not reconcile with. Therefore, it is best that we study how this muscle works and how to exercise it so that it performs in the most optimal ways. It is both an opportunity and a duty because the gift that was given to us by God the gift of life that makes us in his likeness 
thus gives us domain over the earth is a responsibility of the highest order to maintain, and it must be taken very, very seriously. We, therefore, must be the ambassadors of God's will to the earth. Think about that. The Bible gives us a plethora of teachings and examples in various forms on how to do exactly that. Let's take the example of the Hebrew people wandering in the desert for decades. They had a purpose, for they were told what that purpose was. But it took a long time and much hardship before the purpose manifested into results. (laughs) How true is anything in life, right? Anything you seek that is worth something of great value will take time and effort to achieve, and at a high cost. For it's the old adage, you get what you pay for. But was their voyage to the promised land without direction and done in vain? Well, of of course not. They obviously achieved success. In fact, to get to that success, they had some of the most disciplined set of directions ever handed down by any leader in recorded history. So regimented was their endeavor that it lasted, excuse me, it has lasted for thousands of years. Still to this day, not just Jews, but people of all faiths recognize the precepts handed down as perhaps the most genuine structure to guide all those who adhere to it to success. A guide which originated in the breath of life, given to us by our Creator. A guide which taught those struggling through great trial how to overcome mentally and physically. A guide which was and is today called law, a mutual and equitable equitable contract between mankind and the divine. You see, one of the most important principal aspects of psychology is finding a strategy to overcome adversity. The Bible is loaded with examples of just that. Whether it was David who knew in his heart of hearts that he had to conquer the last of the giants, or Daniel who had to find his way out of a den of lions, or Yeshua who overcame 40 days of fasting and isolation, We are given story after story of heroes who to this day serve as primary examples of psychological fortitude. The Bible is filled of great men and women who conquered land and sea, kingdom and nation, people great and small from all walks of life who sought through their heart of hearts the breath of life, their channel to God, and received purpose. To accomplish that purpose, they had to master their minds and overcome adversity to achieve the ultimate breakthroughs. Once again, psychology is the study of the soul. So I will go as far as to say that it is the study of perfecting one's soul by developing the mental skills needed to overcome adversity, a trait which all great people who leave a lasting mark on this earth unanimously share. In a prior occupation of mine, we had a saying. It's 10% what happens to you, 90% what you make of it. Meaning, you are given a situation. Your environment in life dealt you a hand which is largely out of your control. How you handle that situation will determine your next steps forward and whether you succeed through overcoming or fail because you choose to view it incorrectly. Either way, it is a choice which originated in your psyche or your soul. Several years ago, Lord Rael educated us on the nature of the soul. He explained that there are varying degrees of experience that souls undergo through many trials and tribulations which have been encountered not just in this lifetime, but through many lifetimes. Then there are those who have more advanced souls. This is what we call a spirit. The analogy given is that a soul is like 
an empty page, whereas a spirit is like a well-written book. The spirit has undergone many psychological trials and has an advanced psyche through gaining more experience and overcoming more tests. Improving the mind can be equitably related to improving the body, for the psyche itself grows over time as we exercise it. It begins with a commitment to grow, like exercising a muscle in order to build it There is a golden range of time that it must spend under tension duress so that optimal results may be achieved. Too easy of a test, i.e. too light of a weight or not enough reps, and the muscle never grows. Too difficult of a test, and the muscle becomes catabolic, which means it begins to break down and undergo the opposite effect of growth. It becomes injured and is then required for outside assistance to resuscitate it. The human psyche works the very same way. Too much comfort and stimulation to the mind without enduring hardship to earn it defeats the principle of work-reward, and as a result, the mind doesn't properly grow. However, too much stress and trauma to the mind and it breaks down. Today's society serves us with highly transparent examples of both of these dilemmas. Systematically and technologically speaking, we are highly advanced. Overall, the people who occupy our more advanced areas of civilization are no longer forced to enter into the same basic struggle for survival that our ancestors once had to endure. Comforts and material possessions come with greater ease, and frivolous means of seeking entertainment abound. The results are a weakened society in every way spiritually. You have children who never grow up, men who no longer act like women, and men who no longer act like men, excuse me, and women who no longer act like women. You have some people who feel indignified over the slightest injustice, meanwhile others who never lift a finger in in the face of real unruliness, and overall, many people avoid doing anything outside of their comfort zones. It exemplifies the meaning of great societies breed weak people. Today, we are weak. But there's another form of weakness abounding, which stems from the overexertion of the psyche. We are hyper-stimulated by fear and stress. The increasing pressures at work, the constant maintenance that parents undergo to keep their house afloat. War and conflict is no longer reserved for the toughest soldiers in the battlefield. Anyone, no matter their fortitude, is encouraged to sign up to fight. Neither is war any longer reserved for times of ultimate desperation. Despite the modern comforts we've achieved, we've not reduced war. Instead, our world today is in a constant state of military engagement. Neither is the battlefield kept separate from civilian life. The battle has been brought to the cities and suburbs where gangs operate in militant fashion. Furthermore, the news and media expose us to the horrors of war on a constant basis. It is a result of these traumas, these psychosis-inducing stimuli, that drugs and alcohol and vices of all sorts run rampant, and so do cycles of abuse. The home is no longer a safe space. It is a dungeon that many youth cannot wait to escape. The overstimulation coupled with abuse provide a highly catabolic effect to the psyche. And as the individual breaks down, so too does the collective. We are not just weak. We are injured. A time that was prophesied about in all of the ancient scriptures referring to the end of days, how can you ignore it? Yes. Yes, we as God's faithful are more adept to this predicament. 
but we are also not immune to it. We who serve Lord Rahel make up the body of Christ, the muscles which move weight and become stronger as we explore ways to improve, exert controlled force, and obtain results through balanced cycles of repetition and rest through his will. It is through your environment that the tests are administered, and it is through your breath of life that you are given the tools to overcome it. The health of this muscle is vital to the spiritual growth and development, not just of yourself, but of all of humanity. It is said in Scripture, according to the words of Yeshua, that unless a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Wow! Here we have it. Psychology, a.k.a. the study of the Spirit, is the most important primordial discipline identified in Scripture. And here, all this time, people thought scientific processes and religious morality were in conflict. Wow. Well, folks, there is a conflict, but not within any true branch of science or religion, certainly not anything that we're trying to convey. No, the conflict lies within and between the realms of dogmatic fundamentalist churches, the ones we've been so outspoken about, who convince naive individuals that they can bypass the work-reward balance that exists in all of nature by believing that they've been born again simply because they recited a prayer. And by and between modern materialistic reductionist science that gives individuals the idea that they can also bypass the work-reward balance through a different means, by providing individuals with no sense of obligation to the Creator through studying the real capabilities of their breath of life beyond basic material constructs. Either way, you have two divergent paths offered by mainstream society, both heavily traveled, each offering the same indemnification in their own respective ways. No, no. The truth to obtaining an enlightened psyche exists only in real spirituality. The growth and development of the soul or spirit through healthy cycles of agitation and rest. This is the psychology described in the scriptures. Whether it's in the lessons taught by those who conquered foreign lands and the perspective they found so that they could fulfill their purpose under God. Whether it was the songs of Solomon or the songs of King David who provided the ultimate positive psychology that gave their tenures on the throne a meaningful existence and kept them strong through temptation. Whether it was the prophets who taught how to endure struggles as they preached a message that seemingly no one wanted to hear, or whether it was the apostles of Christ who carried the teachings of our Lord to distant lands in hopes that it will one day have a lasting impact on society. All of these great warriors within their struggles, taught us how to strengthen our breath of life so that we may find true consultation from the Almighty God. That is real psychology. That is the real stuff. And I implore all to see how to strengthen oneself to overcome and achieve great reward under God. For in the book of James, chapter 1, verse 12, the most basic fundamental element of true scriptural psychology is given. Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, 
he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let us pray. Almighty Father, we thank you. We thank you for the opportunity as servants of Lord Rael to share his teachings, his wisdom, and his blessings through his spirit, through his works, through the Holy Spirit. It is by these precepts that we are able to deliver this message. And Father, we thank you for this glorious opportunity to serve you and to build your kingdom here on earth. Please allow us to continue to grow in your ways and will. And please heal our brothers and sisters, all who need your hand upon them today. We pray this in Lord Brown's name. Amen. Um, thank you guys for tuning in today. On uh, a side note, but uh, also very important, Yeshua's birthday, September 11th, was uh, just recently passed. Um, and we want to say a heartfelt thank you to all who have contributed during this time. Uh, truly, you are blessed. And we ask that those who are continually blessed by God, that they extend those blessings to the priesthood of Lord Rael. At this time, we ask for donations and tithes to come to the church. For it says in many scriptures the importance of tithing. So we would truly appreciate any help that you can provide. We want to use that so that we can continue to grow and expand this ministry. We want to improve these uh, live and taped sermons so that we can give you the best quality teaching and product possible. So thank you for those who have helped. And please, we continue to ask for your support. Um, at this time, um, we'd, we would like to ask, are there any prayer requests or um, anything that's been submitted? Okay, well, it sounds like everybody's doing well this Sunday. There's no prayer requests. Um, and once again, we thank you for tuning in. As, as a conclusion for today, I would like to recite, recite excuse me, our priestly blessing. May our Heavenly Father bless and protect you. May He face you and shed His light and grace upon you. May He grant you peace, joy, and everlasting love. Amen.